Jerusalem, once so full of people, is now deserted. She who was once great among the nations now sits alone like a widow. Once the queen of all the earth, she's now a slave. She sobs through the night. Tears stream down her cheeks. Among all her lovers, there is no one left to comfort her. All her friends have betrayed her and become her enemies. Everybody say amen. Please be seated. Lord, we ask that you do something special. Special in our hearts and in our minds during this time of teaching. In all of us, including the one teaching in Jesus' name, amen. If you're joining us just for the first time, uh, this is the second week of a six-week series that we have uh, labeled, What Next? Everybody shout, what's next? Okay. Opportunities in transition is what we're looking at. Here's the deal, the big idea for the day is that uh, all of us have to navigate transitions across the landscape of our lives uh, if, we are to both, if we are to keep growing both in life and in our faith. Last week I told you that uh, there are at least two types of transitions. It's those transitions that you and I choose for. For example, uh, you may choose to apply for that job. Get it? That's a transition. And it's those transitions that we don't choose for, but rather they choose us. Like aging or becoming ill. They choose us. The fact of the matter is, because of the anatomy of transition, everybody shout anatomy. The structure of transition, every transition has the same three stages. And because of that, there is always an opportunity for you to emerge on the other side a better person and for you to emerge on the other side knowing God better with a deeper faith. So the anatomy of transition we introduced last week has three parts. First, endings. Everybody shout endings. endings. We're going to talk about that today, how to do endings well. Second, the middle passage, shout middle passage. That's a time of confusion and, and uh, high anxiety and, the, and the, the destruction of our identity. And, and we're going to talk about next week's how to navigate that over the course of the next couple of weeks. And then new beginnings. Everybody shout new beginnings. Buried in every ending is a new beginning. If you're willing to do the work. And work through a new chapter, a new season to come. So today I want to talk a little bit about how to do endings better. None of us will do them perfectly, but how to do them better. Here's where I want to start. When you think about the whole uh, Bible, it's made up of different genres and categories of teachings and literature, as, as folk would say. And one is poetry. And inside of the poetic books, which we can also refer to as wisdom books, for example, there's Psalms and Proverbs. And one theologian points out that if you look at Psalms uh, as one example, you will find that there are basically two large categories for worship. Everybody shout worship. The first large category, which we are very familiar with, is celebration. Shout celebration. Uh, that's where we acknowledge the great things that God is doing and has done, and we celebrate that. Psalms 103 is an example of that. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. That's celebration. That, that's, that's, that's where in worship we're reminded that God is what? Good. Come on, tell the person next to you, God is good. All right, tell them this, and well, let's say this, God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. All right, worship, celebration picks up on that first notion. Uh, uh, God is good uh, 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 all the times. That's celebration. But 40% of the Psalms pick up on the other side. The other side of what I said was, all the time, shout all the time, God is good. That means God is good when I'm on the mountaintop. Things are going extremely well. God is good. But it also means that God is good when I'm in the valley of pain and suffering and loss. God still is what? God still is good. 
And so part of what the psalmist teaches and what we will learn in the book of Lamentations is that another part of worship is actually affirming, as my wife has re repeatedly says, when you don't understand what God is doing, stand on what you know about God. Right? So 40% of the psalms is what we call is, is a lament. If I say lament. That's when I'm in the midst of suffering and pain and hurt. And I don't understand what God is doing. But I'm working hard to stand on what I know about God. And I begin to engage God, not by celebrating all the good that God has done, but by sharing with God my suffering. Being honest with God about it. Crying out to God. That's this notion of lamenting. Now we see this through Scripture. For example, Psalms 42, we see that. The writer says, as the deer pants for the water brook, so pants my soul for thee, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and see him? And then verse 3 says, my tears have been my food both day and night. And here's a brother uh, who's writing, who's essentially saying, you know, I woke up one day and life just didn't make sense. Have you ever, have you ever awakened to discover that life just doesn't make sense? There's some stuff that has happened in your life and to you and around you that's making you go, what? And then the question, where are you, God? How could you let this happen? Talk, engage with me here. That's a part of worship too. And the writer of Lamentations lifts this and uses this. All right, let's get there. Here, here we go. There are two major events Last week, I told you about the exodus. God delivered the children of the nation of Israel from slavery through the Red Sea. This week, I want to tell you, because this is the context for the book of Lamentations, about exile. Everybody shout exile. Here's, 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 here's the sweep of Scripture. First, the nation of Israel is under the leadership of Moses, goes to the Red Sea, transforms from being raggedy tribes, begin to emerge as a nation with laws. Then goes from Moses to Joshua, from Joshua to Judges, charismatic leaders who are continuing to lead. Then comes the first king, Saul. And then after Saul comes David. Under David, the nation of Israel becomes strong and powerful. We call it the United Monarchy. And then David's son takes the nation of Israel to its penis, to its zenith. That, that it is it's a golden era that uh, is wealthy and powerful. And then when his son dies... The nation of Israel splits. And there's the northern tribes. The capital is Samaria. And the southern tribe, which is Judah, the capital is Jerusalem. And before long, the Assyrians wipe out the northern tribe. But Jerusalem... That is the place where the Spirit of God dwells. That's where the temple is. And the folk felt like nothing will ever, no tragedy of that, matter, of that magnitude would hit us. And yet, in time, the Babylonians come and they break down the walls. They destroy the city. And lo and behold, they destroy the temple. And they, they, they push out all of the wealthy, powerful people, push them into exile. Everybody shout exile. Into Babylon. So, Jeremiah is the writer here. And when you read the letter of Jeremiah, he's, the book of Jeremiah, he's writing to the folk who are in exile in Babylon, the Jewish leaders. But lamentation is addressed to those who remained in Jerusalem, looking at a shattered, broken down temple, broken walls, a desecrated city, trying to make sense out of what just doesn't make sense. This is where he writes. Now, here's the first insight. Jeremiah shapes this book as liturgy, which means he invites the community to enter into uh, this notion of worship by sharing their pain and their suffering with one another and with God. Here's a quick, quick insight. You cannot do endings well by yourself. Amen. Tell somebody next to you, you need somebody to help you with your endings. Somebody else. 
So the community was to worship in this notion of lamenting, pouring out their suffering and their cry. Now, there's a word here that is not easily recognized uh, in the English. You can read this in the NIV. It gets closer to it. Uh, but the Hebrew word here is E-K-A, Ika. And it means alas. Or it means how. Uh, the, 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 the real contemporary version is stuff like, how could this be? So essentially the text begins with the words, how tragic this is. How could this be? Come on, let's put verse 1 up there. Let's read it. Let's see how, it, let's see, here's how it's framed. All right, verse 1. Listen, this is what he says. For Jerusalem, once so full of people, is now deserted. How could this be? It's a oh my goodness moment. It's a oh my God moment. How tragic. She who was once great among the nations now sits alone as a widow. And the, and, and, and the, pulse, the pulsating explanation mark is how could this be? How did this happen? Everybody shout how? And then once the queen of all the earth, the person, the nation of power, she's now a slave. Started off a slave, went to the pinnacle of power, now ends up a slave. How tragic, oh my goodness, how could this be? So the first thing about dealing with endings is you got to be able to recognize your oh my goodness moment. You got to be able to recognize the oh my God moment. Not as a sling, but really oh my God. How could this be? It's the beginning of endings. Everybody shout recognition. Let me tell you a story. The story. My grand uncle, who raised me, entered a season of his life where we began to notice some things that was unfamiliar to him. He'd pass by the road that turns to our house, and he would seem not to remember that that was the road. On a few occasions, he got so confused that somebody had to actually bring him home because he couldn't figure out how to get home. Then, one day at church, an evening, Tuesday evening, he was speaking, and he became totally incoherent, fragmented. After he finished, he went outside. I went to get him so I could try to take him home, and he was screaming and yelling at the top of his voice. I'd never seen this before, and, and I was trying to get him in the car, and he was running around the car, and he was swinging at me, and, 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 and that was so horrendous and so tremendous I finally got him home and what we found out was what happened in that moment was that his sugar his 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 his, his diabetes had was had gone over the off the charts and he had really kind of sense of lost his his sanity in that moment but that was my oh my goodness moment I should have had an oh my goodness moment the first time somebody brought him home because he couldn't figure out how to get home. But you know, that's how we normally do. We, we, we have a tendency to deny the painful until it just breaks through and I could not ignore it. And it was how tragic, oh my God. I began to realize in that moment I was losing my daddy. The oh my goodness moment is that when the moment you realize that either some, something is dying or has died, something is lost or is being lost. It's like, oh my goodness. And this is what's happening here for the writer, for Jeremiah. There's no explanation. There's no justification. There's no, let me try to explain what's going on. No, no, I just got to sit with this for a moment. I, I, I'm looking at a desecrated, broken down temple. I'm looking at the city has been has blown up. And, 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 and I thought God would never, ever let this happen. I, I just can't understand this. I just got, oh my goodness. 
first stage. You got to kind of sit with it. Cry about it. Don't try to explain it. Just walk with it. And then the second stage is you've got to identify, watch this, the layers. Everybody shout layers. The layers of loss and then mourn. Because it's never just one loss. There are always multiple losses attached to every major loss. And our tendency is to skip over. Listen, I learned this. Uh, let me draw this. Uh, a number of months ago. Now, let me draw this and tell you what I'm trying to draw. If I could draw. I can't draw. I'm just saying, you know that. But if I could draw, uh, I would draw an onion. But since I can't draw an onion, everybody just say pretend. Pretend, <laughs> pretend this is an onion. All right. All right. All right. Actually, this is not too bad. All right. All right. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know, 20 some years ago, a pastor, one of the mentor pastors in my life, who's talking to pastors, preachers, he said, Look, guys, and in that case, in that context, it was all guys. He said, Anybody like you guys who are always talking about the Lord said, I heard the Lord say, I think God is saying to me, he said, y'all need a therapist. <laughs> Everybody shout therapist. And, and he went on to talk, because his point was, if you meet somebody on the street and they come up to you and say, God said that generally speaking, we think those folk are kind of disconnected. But preachers, we do that all the time. And so what he was saying is in order to stay grounded, come on now, you need a therapist to talk to on a regular basis. And so out of that, took me a, a little while, but out of that, I got me a therapist. So I have a therapist. I'm going to tell the person, my pastor has a therapist. Tell him. <laughs> all right, all right. And, and by the way, let me let you in on a secret. Every therapist has a therapist. So I don't know why some of y'all are talking about I don't need a therapist. Come on now. I, I, I believe that God gives us doctors and God gives us therapists. Why? Because whenever you have an oh my God moment, you can't fix yourself. You need somebody who can engage you and ask the right questions. So my therapist is a former Presbyterian pastor who licensed therapists. And I go to him periodically. And... When I went to him last time, because something triggered a loss. My dad's loss is over 30 years. And I've had other losses. And I ran into something that triggered for me a reaction. And, and, and you, you, you just got to learn yourself. Some of us, you don't know yourself well enough. But, 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 but sometimes you discover that your nerves are raw. And you get angry in times that you normally don't get angry. That's a sign that something is going on. All right. So I went and sat down and talked to him. He said, Herman, he said, he said here's, here's what's going on. I said, I said, it's been 30 years. He said, no, you don't understand how pain works. He said, there's a woundedness. He said, some woundedness is so deep that the loss that's attached to it is in layers. And you work through the first layer. It may take you six months or a year to work through the first layer. And you say, I'm okay. And then you go for a little while and then something triggers. And when that something triggers, what it's doing is exposing. Now there's another layer for you to work through. And so you got to work through and pray through and process through that, that, that new layer, right? And then you say, oh, I'm okay. I'm good. And it might be a year and a half, two years later, something triggers again. And what that now is revealing, that there's yet a third layer. Come on now, to work through these, there's another layer that needs to. So, so you just got to keep praying through, working it through. Everybody shout endings. Endings, endings. So, you got to identify what are the losses. If you look at this text, 
uh, uh, verse 1, what we just read, he was identifying the losses. He was saying, we were once a mighty, powerful city, that was a, a country that was sovereign. Now we've lost our sovereignty. We were slaves. We were beautiful. We, you've looked at our temple, you could be reminded how beautiful we were in the world. Uh, how people saw us and how we saw ourselves. That's been shattered. That's gone. That we occupied a certain space in the world with power and prestige. That's been wiped out. That's gone. Now we're like a widow sitting in a rocking chair in a room by herself. Wow. He's identifying the losses. Let me give you a practical example of what this looks like in real life. One woman, this true story, husband left her in the middle of a midlife crisis. For her it was an oh my God moment, how tragic. It drove her to see her therapist. And for the first six, seven sessions, it was just about just trying to survive the hurt. Some of y'all know what that's like, right? You're not trying to fix it. You're just trying to survive it. You're just trying to find a reason to wake up in the morning. And when you're just trying to find a reason to keep going, you're just trying to survive the hurt. First few sessions, that's what it was all about. And then they started to examine when you've lost your husband, exactly what is it that you lost? And she started enumerating it. One was financial security. Because uh, big pay paid most of the bills. Another was uh, a companion. Because even though he worked all the time, was always gone. But when he exited the relationship for the very first time, she felt alone in the world. In other words, she lost a sexual partner. In other words, she lost a confidant. This was the person she returned to to share her, her private. A confidant is somebody who instills confidence. She kept working, y'all. And all of these are important. Because once you identify what the loss is, then you got to ask the question, how is, what's the implications of this loss for me? If he's not my financial source, how am I going to pay these bills? Right? If, if he's not my companion, what do I do when I'm lonely? Come on now. If, 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 if uh, uh, um, he's not my sex partner, what, what choices am I going to make? Uh, 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 he's not there to be my confidant. What do I do when I need to talk to somebody? What's the implications? What are the... What are the changes in my life that I need to shift? Uh, uh, and watch this. Here's the biggest thing. I'm going to tell you something that's interesting. Everybody shout mirror. As important as all these were, after about a year, or six months to a year, she discovered this. Here's what she discovered. She said her husband was the mirror in which she looked in to evaluate how well she was doing. Whew. All right, now let me give you this little insight. You remember I said last week, change and transition is different. Watch this. Some people use change, everybody shout change, as a way to avoid transition. All right, let me say it again. Some people use change as a way to avoid transitions. Ask the person next to you, did you hear what he said? Uh, to ask him, say, I wonder what he's talking about. Ask him. I like the way you wonder. Let me give you an example. I'll give you an example. Watch it. You're in a relationship. 
You run into a pain point. Shout pain point. You exit relationships. Shout change. Six weeks later, you're in a new relationship. You run into a pain point. You exit the relationship. Shout change. Four months later, you're in a new relationship. You run into another pain point. And you exit the relationship. Come on, shout change. All right. Then you, here, here you find yourself saying something like this. I've discovered over the last two years that women are just crazy. Right, right, right. You know, I can't be in a relationship with women. All right, watch this. You got two, two choices. You can become cynical and decide all you're going to do is just be a dog. Hit it and quit it. Come on now. Get yours, let others hang on theirs. All right. Or, watch it, you can back up and say, what does this pain point reveal to me about me? Because this is a pain pattern. What does it reveal about me? What does it reveal about my attitude? What does it reveal about my identity? Come on now. And, and if you keep changing, but, but do not ask the tough questions. You change without transitioning because you'll never discover that you're looking at somebody else for an evaluation of yourself. Come on now. And, 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 and if you can discover it, transition is a shift in psychology. It's a shift in your emotions. It's a shift in your spirituality. Come on now. And, and, and what that woman discovered a year later, she said, at the end of the day, I thank God. I, don't, I, I hate the divorce, but I thank God for the gift I got out of it because she said, I discovered that from now on, I'm not going to look at other people to discover who I am. Come on now. That's transition. All right, so let me ask you a question. What pain pattern in your life you've been ignoring? For some people, they're looking for the perfect friend. And that definition of the perfect friend is the person who will never hurt me. For others, they're looking for the perfect job. And so they leave this job, bad boss, leave this job, bad boss, without ever asking the question, what is it in me that keeps helping me to, to get bad bosses? Come on. Some people are looking... Uh, uh, some people work it out with leadership. They're looking for the perfect leader. And the moment they find some flaw in her, come on now, they say she's not worthy of my fellowship. In all of those instances, it's because you have not taken time to pull back the layers. To ask yourself what's going on behind the hood, up under the hood. Come on. You, 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 you've not taken time because if you do, come on, you'll reach a particular point. Where, 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 where you don't have to change the relationship to change you. You reach, you reach a point where you change. You, you, you got to figure out, here's the third point. You got to then figure out what am I going to let go. Some of the stuff you got to let go is how you look at the world. Some of the stuff you got to let go is how you understand your identity. Some of the stuff you got to let go is how you understand your role. And so, in terms of how you look at the world, you need to let go this notion that in order for him to be my friend, he's got to be perfect. Because that's a fantasy. It's not reality. Because whoever you get into a relationship with, friend or love, they will hurt you because they're imperfect. But let me give you a flash. You will hurt them too. So the question is not, will you hurt me? The question is, will the hurt be worth it? I'm not looking for perfection in a leader. I'm looking for faithfulness. That's a worldview shift. All right. Come on, everybody shout, let it go. All right, let me give you one final example as we pull this to a close. Let's just look. Sometimes it's deeper than you can imagine. 
few years later, my father became so uh, victimized by Alzheimer's that he could not stay at his home. At that time, I was a young pastor in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. And I grew up with this commitment because my grand uncle and aunt, they raised me. They had essentially adopted me. And my commitment was, my grand aunt died early. But my commitment was that if ever they got to a place where they couldn't take care of themselves, my paradigm for how I cared for them was shaped by the notion that I would have them to move in with me and I wouldn't put them in an institution. That was a core conviction of mine. Everybody shout core conviction. It was at the very heart of my worldview that a faithful son, here's what a faithful son looks like when his father is unable to take care. It looks like the son moving the father in the house, doing whatever is necessary to take care of him. That was my paradigm for a faithful son. It was my worldview. I moved that in. My wife was remarkable. She never missed a mix. Absolutely. By the weekend, I discovered my paradigm began to break. Because dad would sneak out at night. And he's in Pine Bluff, doesn't know anything about that. Going across the street, lost. And so I thought I could handle it. So I started camping out in the living room. But then dad went out the back door. And then after a while, after, after a few near misses, I had to come to the realization that I was not equipped to care for him at home. That the really, I, I could soothe my ego by keeping him here. But to really care for him meant I needed to put him in a facility where he couldn't get out of the doors, where they had the resources and I shift my paradigm. And that was horrendously painful for me. But I had to slowly let it go. All right, everybody say morning. That's, that's, that's grief word. Come on, come on, come on. If you, if you put, put verse number two up here, here's what I say. You got to identify what you're going to let go. You got to identify the layers, and then you got to mourn it. You don't try, you got to mourn it. Watch what it, here's what it says. It says, she sobs through the night. That was me. Tears stream down her cheeks. That was me. And it goes on to describe the description. Verse 16, put verse 16 up there. Verse 16, after they list all the things that they've lost, verse 16 starts out, for all these things I weep. I was weeping the loss of my dad and the loss of my ability to protect him. I had to let it go. That was a shift. Now, here's one of the problems. Everybody shout weep. There's a little insight about weeping. Weeping is a reaction to the process of transition. It is not the process. Say it with me. Say weeping is a reaction to the process. It's not the process. See, it's possible for you to cry and weep but never ask the hard questions to leave one relationship and go to another relationship and you're weeping, in but, but, but you're changing, but you're not transitioning. Weeping is appropriate, but, 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 but Jeremiah says let's weep in the context of allowing God to do what God needs to do inside of us. And then remember we weep differently. Tell the person next to you, we weep differently. I was told a story, a true story about a couple. They lost their kid at the age of 18. The mother weeped ferociously. The father shed a few tears, but didn't do a lot of weeping. The mother assumed that the father was disassociated, disconnected, and uncaring. Didn't care as deeply as she did. Became angry, resentful at him. One day she got word that something needed to be fixed at the cemetery. So she went out to the cemetery to run into the, 
the graveyard keeper, and he told her, first of all, the, it, whatever it was, was fixed. And then he said to her, you know, your husband is here twice a week. And he's trimming the grass, he's fixing, he's nurturing, he's caring. And suddenly, the wife realized that just because she didn't see any tears didn't mean that he wasn't weeping. His weeping was showing up at the graveyard twice a week, tending and dealing with the reality of the loss of his child. Everybody shout weeping. Never confuse weeping in the process with the process. Last point. The temple was torn down. Everybody shout the temple. This was horrendous. This was the worst thing for Israel. Because the temple for centuries had been the place where they understood that the presence of God, the favor of God was in their midst. And when that temple got torn down and desecrated, it forced them to begin to think differently about God. They asked some hard questions about about, about well, what does this tell me about God? And, 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 and to work on their theology, because their theology had previously said, God is with us, and therefore, uh, he will keep us out of tragedy. But when they woke up in the midst of tragedy, they then had to figure out where was God. And in the questioning process, come on now, they discovered that God is not somebody who keeps us out of tragedy. He keeps us through tragedy. As we go through tragedy, it keeps us from losing our mind. As we go through tragedy, he keeps us from doing crazy stuff. As we go through tragedy, he keeps us from giving up. As we go through tragedy. And then lastly, they had to face the reality that the providence of God is never attached to a building. I, 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 I think, let me end here since we're moving, y'all. I, I, I think, let me just ask the question, is it possible that God is moving us from SDA to Redwood City because he's once again trying to teach us that the providence of God, the power of God, the plan of God, the purposes of God is never attached to a building. That the church is about the people of God. And that he's repositioning us to Redwood City because he wants us to stretch out our reach, y'all. Because he wants us to touch some lives we can't touch here. Because he's got a Bay Area vision, y'all. And he's trying to teach us to follow where he sends. Whew. Somebody shout wow. Shout amen. Give God a hand raise. I want you to take your connection card now. We're finished. Look at the next steps. Think about what your next step's going to be. Here's a time for you to say yes to Jesus, to be baptized, to join the kingdom movement. I want you to flip the card over and look at the response to the message. Here's what I want you to write in the response to the message if you're serious about it. Because it's a challenge that I want you to do this week. It's a little twist from what I asked you to do last week. Here it is. Here. I want you to write. Watch this. I will examine my most recent ending. You might be in the middle of one right now. And here's how I want you to examine it. Have you acknowledged the oh my God moment? That this is a big deal? Have you begun to think about what are the different layers of loss I'm experiencing? And have you allowed yourself to start grieving as you ask tough questions? What does it say about me? What does it say about God? What does it say about where I need to transition internally? And are you able to say goodbye? And sometimes you have to develop the discipline of goodbye. You got to say it again and again and again until one day it's gone. Everybody shout, let it go. I want to challenge you to make this commitment as he plays. I hope you're right and say, I'm going to do it. You won't be perfect at it. Just give it your best. 
show up here next week. Take a, take a few seconds. Everybody shout amen. Please stand. If you filled out this card, I want you to turn it in. Don't take it home with you. Turn it in. That's your commitment. We've got folk who will be praying over, praying with you.